Premier, we'll just ask you to take a seat there, and I'm sure that Professor Ted Melwish is going to join you as well. Uh, Susan Close is the Minister for Education and Early Childhood Development. She's also on our panel. And Dr Sarah Glover is the director of the Mitchell Institute at Victoria University. She took up the top post just two months ago, but she's worked at the Institute much longer than that as the Education Program Director, and she brings a network of international education leaders to Mitchell. And many of you would know Sam Page from Early Childhood Australia. She's worked for 20 years across service delivery, management, social policy analysis and advocacy. Now, I did have a few questions mocked up, but we only have a short period of time, and I'm sure all of you have lots of questions, particularly for the Premier, seeing as he's just made those announcements about the COAG agenda. So we've got two microphones, one right here and one over there. And uh, don't be shy. If you guys have got a question, then please jump up and get in front of those mics, because uh, we'd love to hear your questions. And if not, you're going to have to listen to my questions, and I can tell you yours will be much better than mine. Um, we'll also ask you just to give us your name and your organisation before you ask your question and if you can keep it short then we'll try and get through as many questions and answers as possible. Any takers? Ah, right one down the front here. You'll have to have a big voice if you haven't got a microphone. Uh, pretty optimistic. Um, I mean, we've been talking about this for a long time and it's been pretty positively received. Uh, ironically, the previous Prime Minister, who you know, wouldn't be regarded as the most progressive uh, person in this country, had a pretty good position on this. Uh, might have something to do with his wife being a, a preschool director. Um, but um, no, to be fair to him, he, he actually assisted in, in this agenda going forward, so that, that was good. That also meant that some of the other conservative states were particularly interested. The Victorian Premier is very supportive. Um, the, and now, w with the new Prime Minister, he's allocated childcare back into the education portfolio. So that's a very positive sign. And we also saw an announcement uh, a few weeks ago, I think, by the new Minister for Education, who seemed to be saying something very similar to the sorts of things we've been saying. So, Look, I don't think there's an enormous appetite for the Commonwealth to spend any extra money in this field, but that's w the point about the tax reform is that if, if there are big discussions about money sloshing around and there are new revenue sources being talked about, you know, a billion dollars would go a very long way in this agenda, but be a pretty small proportion of the sort of total national tax discussions that we're talking about. So I think it does open up those possibilities. So I, I wouldn't say it's done and dusted, but I think we will get something positive out of the December 11th meeting. Remembering that the other agendas that we discussed were um, are less well developed than early childhood development. So if the Prime Minister wants to leave that meeting with a, an outcome, we're saying, well, here's, here's one for you, you can, you can sign this. But uh, I'm not entirely sure I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I couldn't be certain what's going to happen. Uh, so just a, a, a supplementary, a yeah. <laughs> One down here, big voice. So it's perhaps in the polling council of state school organisations. It's for you, Ted, your your fellow leaders from our youth in my past days. <laughs> Sorry, I'm Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Embarrassing. <laughs> Okay, well, 
as you say, in the UK we have Ofsted, which provides uh, inspections and gradings of uh, centers uh, all over the country. Uh, but we didn't use Ofsted ratings in our research at all. We actually did direct observations of what was happening in the daytime with the children. We looked at the activities of the children, we looked at the interactions between the children and the staff, what, what kinds of ha things happening, and we used uh, think what's called the Early Childhood Environment Rating Scale. There are two versions of this, we used both versions of it in our assessments of children. And this brings us back to the issue of what is quality in early childhood? Well, I can sum it up in three words. Interactions drive development. Okay? Good interactions which are responsive to the child's communications and develop the child's communication skills and thinking capacity are what lead to good quality in early childhood education. Now, we have other measures of quality, which I mentioned in the case of Denmark. Things like staffing qualifications, staffing ratios, uh, stability of staff and so on. Now those structural aspects of quality are important because they provide the foundations for what we call process quality, the day-to-day -day experiences of child, to be improved. Okay? So remember this, interactions drive development. Get the interactions right, and most of the other things will come on stream. Now, we might ask you there, but we're going to bring you a microphone so that everyone can hear you nice and clearly. Thank you, I'm Sumita Rani from Early Learning Association Australia in Melbourne. Uh, it's a two-part question. The first is to Professor Melush, and the second part is to the Premier. Um, in your presentation, you talked, and I think it came through quite clearly, that um, the children from professional families have a lot more um, exposure to words and the forms that you're yes. noticing in the industry. And then it sort of came down with um, worker families and yeah. medical families. So obviously, if you are trying to improve the outcomes for children in the early years, there is a corresponding piece of work that needs to happen with the parents as well. So to what extent did you say, um, put some measures in place for the parents. That's my question to you. Yes. And to, to the Premier is, if you are presenting a proposal to Quai to address the early childhood crisis, to what extent is your recommendation going to include something for the parents as well? Okay. Well, you're um, exactly right. If we can improve the home learning environment and parenting, we will make a big difference for children. Very big difference. However, when we're thinking about policy, the policy levers that we have over early childhood education and care are like a steel bar. The policy levers we have for parenting are like a piece of wet spaghetti. <laughs> that is, in a democratic society, it's very difficult to change parenting. It's not that it can't be done, and parenting support programs can work, particularly if they're very well implemented. But there is this issue with regard to the nature of policy. In a democratic society, we can't legislate for parenting. And parenting is part of culture. When you change parenting, you're actually changing the culture of that person. You have to think about what parenting is. Parenting is a learnt skill. It's learnt through observational learning in an informal way. You, you, be, you behave as a parent partly on the basis of what you, how your parents treated you. You see how your sister be, treats her child and she sees it, so it sees it works or it doesn't work. So you imitate her maybe. You, your neighbours do things with their children and you follow them. And you know, within your culture, there's a particular way of dealing with children, and you, f you follow that through in informal observational learning. Now, to change parenting, we've got to change those cultural influences. And certainly, we, what we find is that within different subgroups, we have different cultural practices and different parenting practices, and they have consequences for the children. And part of changing parenting is making parents much, much more aware of how important their behaviours are for children. 
For example, amongst disadvantaged families, a very common belief is what I would call fatalism. Oh, what I do with the kid is not going to make much difference. He's just going to be like what he is what he, anyway. Okay? Now, that's a quite common belief amongst disadvantaged parents. And we actually did case studies of children from disadvantaged families where they performed against the odds and then became, did very well in school and had very good outcomes. And what we found was the parents of those children showed a very distinct set, different set of beliefs to the majority of the disadvantaged families in our study. And in particular, they showed a concentration in their belief that what they were doing with the child every day made a difference. And they therefore changed what they did every day to make that difference. And that's what led to those children performing against the odds. Premier? Um, parenting is central to early childhood development and it, it's central to really the ideas that we're seeking to advance to the Commonwealth. I'll just give you an example of, of why this vision of uh, uh, birth to essentially end of secondary school is so profound. The, I mean, we tend to think that in schools that um, these teachers are meant to perform miracles when the school the, the, teach, the, the child walks through the school gate, whereas what we now know is that much of the, the learning trajectory is established even before they walk through the school gate. If you, had a, if you had a line of sight for, say, the principal of the school, ideally a birth to 12 school, all the way back to the start, that would profoundly change the allocation of resources and the concerns of those school or educational leaders about how they engaged with children from birth. I mean, in a perfect world, I'd have every school as birth to 12 and there'd be children's centres on site and we would be engaging with parents in that way. But so structurally, having this vision of birth to 12 actually gives us the, uh, the structural capacity to actually get our leaders, rather than seeing themselves just being in a service system, which is about dealing with a certain set of children at a certain episode of, of age in their life, they would be thinking right from the start because it would make sense to them if they wanted to improve their outcomes to be more deeply involved earlier. And this also goes to the, the idea of integrating the service system. So if you've got your healthcare system, your education system, your disability services system, your family support system, if one level of government was responsible for all of those things, there could be better integration of those services. For instance, I mean, if you go now, as a parent, if you go now to those um, uh, antenatal uh, sessions. They just teach you how to sh ch uh, change the nappy and, uh, and you know, to some extent how to um, breastfeed and a few other bits and pieces. But there's no reference at all to reading to a child right from the start or the profound way in which they can develop. And so you, you don't, there's no, that, uh, that opportunity is, is just seen as a health opportunity. It's not, it's not integrated across the whole developmental uh, field. So I think, so I think the structural changes may not seem like may not seem like an answer to parenting of themselves, but they open up the possibility of a much broader conversation about parenting. There's another whole conversation about, uh, I think, the communication question, and um, there is some important work that was done some time ago now, uh, the early childhood development story that essentially messaging, which is about trying to assist. Uh, parents to actually understand this. Because I think, I think some parents are ignorant uh, of what, as, as the professor just mentioned, there are some erroneous views about how children develop. I mean, the truth is they don't, they, many, they usually don't speak very much for a couple of years. We now know that the, the language part of their brain is being wired up very profoundly in the early months. So if you thought that, if you thought that, that speech was something that you leave to a time when they start talking, then you would have missed a whole developmental opportunity. That's just something that some parents don't have as information. If they had that as information, mm -hmm. they would start talking. Now, fortunately, many of us have just grown up watching our parents, and there seems to be a natural instinct for you to want to talk to your children, and, and you know the baby talk that, that we all sort of seem to naturally engage in. There seems to be this natural sense in which we do want to engage with children. 
But some parents don't understand how important that is and wouldn't dream of reading to a child even from, from the earliest stage and, and explaining that and why it's important. Because uh, I think parents are eager to learn, even the most, even, even parents in great difficulty um, want their child to be, to be the best they can be. And uh, I think just giving them some information at an early stage <coughs> could profoundly affect the way they parent. So I think that's all part of the story. We'll come to the lady in the purple and then the lady in the black and white after that. But I might just ask uh, Dr Glover, did you want to expand on that? I can see you nodding away furiously. Has the Mitchell Institute uh, done much work in that area? Well, absolutely. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at the whole education system. So how does it build the capabilities of all young people, so from birth all the way through, um, even through tertiary and beyond into adult learning. And because of the very changes um, that are happening in our society, we're going to need uh, young people to learn, relearn, reskill uh, uh, for the future um, prosperity of them as individuals. Uh, uh, of the nation's economy, but also for the health and well-being of communities. So I think the idea of looking at learning as this continuum, and particularly in those early years, uh, is absolutely crucial. And, and what we do know is that, um, you know, about 22% of Australian um, children uh, do arrive at school developmentally vulnerable. Um, that's 68,000 children, so that's a lot of children. And when we trace back, what we also know is that those children have not necessarily had access to any preschool. Um, and secondly, if they have had access to preschool, we actually know that it's for equality. So we really are struggling to uh, look at that continuum. And I think the idea that um, we get some structural alignment uh, on, on levels of government uh, around this, just frees up uh, local communities to be designing the system that is going to meet the needs of children in that community. And, and that's really what, uh, what Mitchell would be saying. Put the children at the centre of this, allow the local decision making to provide the best possible quality early learning experience and wrap the health and uh, so on around that, uh, we cannot continue to do this with different levels of government, um, putting incentives here, um, fragmenting it for families, and quite frankly, families can't really afford it even with the subsidies, so we're locking out a large number of families of this vital opportunity. Over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm Barbara Latham. I'm representing the Montessori Australia Foundation and I'd like to thank you all for putting the statistics and science behind what Maria Montessori knew 100 years ago. <laughs> um, I um, am very um, approving and grateful for the focus on the early years now and how important that is. And it's really wonderful and I congratulate you, um, Premier Whitlam, for making that spotlight really shine for all young children. I guess my um, question, Premier, is perhaps related to um, the provision of the preschooling years in South Australia. Um, as you've already said, there are a lot of um, children receiving those preschool years in non-government services across South Australia in particular. Um, and the um, ASEQA is now looking at the quality overall of the provision of the services, which is a wonderful thing. We have the, the National Quality Framework. Um, and that has determined things like putting in the, 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 the foundations of ratios and staffing and qualifications. Um, in South Australia at the moment, though, there is a differential in ratio between uh, government services and non-government services. And I'm wondering how you see that going forward um, if we are all to be on the same level playing field in provision of service. I think that's where I handball to my <laughs> minister. <laughs> um, actually, in, the, in South Australia, the majority of children at four go to a government preschool, not a non-government, uh, as I understand it. So we are one of the ones that um, concentrates our uh, our services from a government perspective and where that's created a disadvantage with some of the other states is that because they're part of a long daycare setting, 
the parents are able to have their tax rebate and that's um, meant that there's a different funding regime to what we're able to provide where we're unable to get a, a, any kind of um, rebate or federal money in apart from the additional three hours. So uh, that's part of what the Premier's uh, trying to do is to realign the, the funding so that it shouldn't matter where the seating is, who's providing it, there ought to be uh, a full distribution. I also have a concern about um, support for early childhood, whether it's at childcare or in preschool, coming by the tax system at all because, as we've discussed, uh, that then becomes a discussion about parental work and the convenience of being able to put kids somewhere as opposed to what the kids need. And if we think about what the children need, then it tends to be the parents who aren't paying a lot of tax, aren't working a lot of hours, whose children benefit enormously from being in that setting. So I think this, this restructuring of the funding, um, it, it, should it be successful, will be very profound, not only in being able to change the, the age at which we can start preschool potentially, but in uh, really making it squarely about child development and, and that's why I'm so um, enthusiastic about what the Premier's up to. Lady in the black and white there. Hello, <coughs> my name is Sue Hill. I'm <coughs> from the Radio of Australia. One is not to complicate the Premier and remind him of something. We've just finished packing 64,000 pre-Christmas packs that go to all the children across the state. So the babies, toddlers and preschool, preschool is our new one that we've just finished packing. But this year, the baby pack, or next year, 2016, will go through the cast nurse at the two to six week visit. So every cast nurse, when they go to a parent um, with a newborn baby across the state, will actually be talking about um, breathing. They will be giving the pack out, which actually has three picture books, has information about the importance of not only reading, singing, talking and playing, but it also has what's wrong on them as well. And then with the toddler one, it's going to be on um, numerous issues that are concerned nationally. And then with the preschool pack, which is will is work new for next year, that's about school readiness, and that will go to every three-year-old across the state. Um, the concern that I've been in the, this position for 10 years and working in South Australia as well as is 14 other states as well with the early childhood and about parenting and positive parenting practices and the messages and how we actually support parents across the nation with the understanding of what they are doing with their child right from the start and how important it is and how it impacts and it impacts greatly. And, um, from the viewpoint of what I do and what I try to do is, is have that understanding. And there's so many organisations. We're a not-for-profit, we're a charity, we're funded um, predominantly by the state government. Um, we're very thankful for that and it allows us to do what we aim to do, which is to inform parents. But other states don't have that. Um, and um, within uh, Western Australia, they do. They have better beginnings. Ours is called the Little Big Book Club. In Queensland, they've just been given $20 million by the state government, and that's gone to every public library across the state, which is um, being project managed by the, um, uh, the state library. And it um, be interesting how that actually rolls out. Mine is, is that I met with Kevin Rudd in 2010, wanting to do a national um, program where every parent receives a parenting pack or a reading pack when their child is born, then again at toddler, and then again at three years of age. Also that there's a national awareness campaign, like the Slip Flop Flap, we all understand the importance because of that. So can we have a national awareness campaign that goes out across all of the media and providers, informing parents, and not just parents, but grandparents, um, carers, um, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandparents on the absolute importance of how you engage right from the start with your with that child and that it's not just a parent's responsibility it's all of our responsibility as community as the village that's what will actually raise our children to be a, um, to have the better prospects to go on to lifelong learning and so it's how we achieve that um, I have a, a document that I wrote um, in 2010 that I actually um, looks at how we can actually roll out a national program and how we actually bring everyone together. I have the support of every state library who actually signed an agreement as well. But it's how we actually can achieve that, how we can get that message out to families. We know in South Australia, with this research, 
Um, we've I'm going to put you on the panel in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what it showed was that because once you inform the parent, once they know, it will change their practices. And it, that's what we need to do. It's how you get that message across without making any of us feel guilty because we work very hard, we're all busy. But it's how we actually engage with our child and making sure that we're engaging and we keep engaging that that is what will actually change and make the difference for when they're ready to start in school. So I, my, mine is just more of a request of how can we make that happen as well as the reform from um, three is how we can do it from birth and how we can get that positive message and a national message message on the awareness um, to families. Well, a fair, a fair bit of work was done on this um, back in around 2010, actually. There is a, in fact, somebody knows all about it. Maybe they can talk about it. Is that what you were proposing? No. no. Okay, no, I'm sure there's somebody in this room that was involved in it because it, it was a piece of work that was done by National uh, Early Childhood Development Ministers. It was called the... Ah, Engaging Families in the Early Childhood story. Uh, fantastic bit of work was done. It didn't really get an enormous amount of public f funding to make it rolled out. I mean, some, so it, was, it was rolled out. It wasn't rolled out in the sort of national media campaign as the, as the way in which you've contemplated, but it, it, it could, and I think all the work's been done. So I think it is an excellent thing to raise, and um, perhaps we'll, we should regenerate a push for that. I think it's an excellent idea. Also I, I think we only have time for one more question. So, uh, if you if you can promise me to keep it brief, then you can uh, fire away. Absolutely. Mine is just bringing all of the players together. It's that how we actually all the people who are working with an early childhood and a not for profit, how we actually all come together, um, and that would be great from a federal viewpoint of how we can achieve that. Great. I think we've only got time for one left. So. I'm Linda Davison from Australian Community Children Services. Um, I want to talk about uh, something that's come up with e everything people have said today, and that's about quality. But what hasn't been mentioned is early childhood educators. Now, we know that quality is very much tied to educators, to the qualifications of educators, to the ratios of educators to children, to the resources that are provided for educators. Um, I think. Uh, we need to have an early childhood uh, education workforce that is recognised and valued, and that means not just in terms of thinking they're all wonderful people, but that they actually get paid professional wages. And I think we need to be considering that uh, highly qualified early childhood educators need to be employed at all stages of early education, not just for three and four-year-old children, or even for two-year-old children, but for infants onwards. And I go back to what Professor Mellish said earlier, which is that stability of um, care is critical and that, in fact, I think he said something like, without a stable workforce, it's almost impossible to maintain high quality early education. Now, the childcare package, assistance package that we have at the moment makes zero mention of how it will support the early childhood educator workforce. Mm. I'd really like to know what you envisage for that. I might just ask Sam Page to address that one firstly and then we'll come to the Premier. Um, I'm just nodding in furious agreement with you. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's very easy um, to feel so inspired by your vision, Premier, in terms of what we're trying to achieve um, for children and certainly in comparison to some of the policy positions we're seeing at federal level. Um, this uh, feels much more... Uh, right uh, for, for young children and much more about the quality of experience that they have. However, I do think there are some really big questions we need to work through and that is, uh, are we talking birth to f all the way to school? Um, and, and if we are, then how are we going to address the current diversity of providers that we have and the different arrangements we have across service types, are we going to be able to maintain a national commitment to quality? Are we going to be able to address educator wages? Um, and, and how are we going to work through the, the mechanics, I guess, of um, explaining subsidy arrangements to families, having that consistency uh, across the system? Because I think that these are some, some big issues to raise. And I, I'm conscious that 
I haven't had a chance to, to say what my wish list item is, but my wish list item is that uh, all families with young children have access to children's services right from birth. It doesn't start at three. And I know that's not your intention, but I think it's dangerous if we just start with three and think that we're going to push it down later, because I actually think we could split uh, preschool for three and four year olds from the birth to three cohort, and I think that would be really um, problematic if we did that. I think we do need to be talking holistically about children from birth to five. That's not to say that all children go to, to childcare at, from birth, that's not it at all, but that families have access to supportive children's services from birth uh, and that if they need uh, long daycare models from very early age, they've got access to quality services that they can trust and that children can continue with those services right through uh, until they go to school. So there are some uh, you know, I think I could listen to you, Ted, all, all day. Um, Premier, you're my favourite politician in the country. I mean, it's just, what well, some of the things we've heard today is fa fantastic from a vision point of view. What we need to do is put in some serious work, I think, into what would it look like and what would it mean and how do we protect some of the hard fought gains around quality uh, and, um, and, and seeing this as a profession and having an identity as a profession, these are all really important, uh, very recent and quite tenuous in some cases, gains uh, that, that we would want to make sure get built into any proposal going forward to COE. Yeah, look, uh, I think I think the the warning's an important one because we don't want to sacrifice uh, what we've created here and you know, the, obviously everybody's trying to do a lot with very little and so th there will be, a, I think, a temptation to want to smear more resource across a larger number of children and that could sacrifice quality. The, the good news, and you know, you might, some might argue that that's already happened in the past. We used to have early childhood principals uh, here and separate uh, early childhood junior primary schools. So there is, when pressure comes on, it does tend to there is pressure to, to sacrifice, to some degree, some of those quality issues uh, for the imperative of actually spreading resources more thinly. But th the good news, though, the thing that should give you hope is that uh, with the advent of Good Start, which was, I think, a massive, uh, essentially a massive quality agenda when, when ABC Learning fell over and Good Start was created, that was a very powerful impetus for quality in the system. And then, of course, the, the national quality uh, standards, which are all about quality. So what we're doing is we're seeing childcare used to be child mining, and now it's shifted into the early childhood development space. And so what we're now, what we're now seeing, I think, is a greater focus on quality. So we're getting teachers uh, in, in childcare settings as required by regulation. Uh, and uh, I think anything we can do to lift the status of the profession is going to ultimately um, find itself reflected in, uh, you know, better quality wages and, and conditions for, for those workers. So we want this to be a high status profession. Mm -hmm. If this is the most important period of life, then this should be the highest status profession or one of the highest status professions in our community and that should lead to good remuneration, which should lead to a lot of people wanting to, to do it and stay in it. Uh, and that should be good for, for outcomes. So I agree with you and uh, uh, I think w we certainly see this as improved. We're going to have to find a lot of extra teachers uh, in this early childhood system if we move, for instance, to three-year-olds and, of course, if we, and as childcare, has to meet these new quality standards. Now, I know the Premier has to dash off. Uh, he's got a lot of uh, big tasks in relation to the Pinery bushfire and the recovery effort, so we wish him well with that work. We're very privileged, though, that the rest of our speakers will be hanging around for lunch, so I'd encourage you to grab a hold of them and ask them a few questions. We've also got uh, a uh, facilitation session after our half-hour break for lunch, and so hopefully a lot of your great ideas will be able to be put into that. But for now, please thank our panellists. <laughs>